So welcome everyone to yet another session of GSSR seminar series. And today uh, we'll hear the presentation of uh, Andrzej Strzokowski, a PhD candidate in sociology at GSSR. Um, Andrzej uh, will talk about um, introducing sustainable degrowth into policy. Andrzej is uh, also a graduate of law from the University of Warsaw. Uh, he works as a renewable energy senior specialist uh, at the Polish Ministry of Development and Technology. And Andrzej will be accompanied by his supervisor, uh, Professor Piotr Matczak, the head of the Department of Local and Regional Communities Research at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań. And uh, Professor Matczak will have five minutes for introducing uh, the, the work of Andrzej. Um, and then the presentation will be followed by a comment from Dr. Jana Nesterova, a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Department of Geography at the UMEA University. Um, and uh, Dr. Nesterova works at the intersection of Tigro, critical realism, and giving a floor to Professor Matzczak for his introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, uh, I am privileged to work with uh, Andrzej Strzokowski uh, as his supervisor. And my uh, content with this work is that uh, Andrzej is uh, proposing uh, quite interesting and uh, I would even call it novel uh, concept and approach to uh, operationalized uh, degrowth concept in the quite um, uh, real life circumstances. Uh, and what we are going to see today is his uh, initial uh, uh, stage setting. Uh, the, um, he's working on conceptual and also methodological introduction to his work. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is a uh, um, quite ambitious attempt, I, I would say. So, so um, for a PhD candidate to propose a, a new uh, and very ambitious uh, uh, concept is something which is not often uh, possible to see. That, that, that's why there are quite some difficulties in this work, I must, must, I must admit, uh, both in, on the conceptual part and on uh, a methodological one, in the sense how to apply the framework to uh, analyze a concrete uh, objects. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there, there is a substantial progress in the work of, of Andrzej. Uh, however, uh, some issues are still to me uh, to be resolved. Uh, and that's why I think this occasion and his presentation could be uh, an important uh, uh, input for further work uh, by uh, Andrzej. So that would be my introductory uh, remarks, I would suggest us to follow the Andre's presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm giving a floor to Andre, and you have 35 minutes approximately. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Jana, for accepting the, uh, the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, it's very valuable for me. Uh, you are here. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, maybe I will start the, the timer. Okay, so uh, I will uh, review the main uh, elements of the article uh, in the form of, uh, of uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to start from uh, introductory remarks. Uh, actually about difficulties uh, that I have uh, with this uh, paper. Uh, 
uh, because uh, it's not uh, easy paper for me and and uh, i can admit that uh, first of all uh, first of all uh, this paper has quite long history because i started thinking about this uh, before my uh, master thesis and i outlined uh, for the first systematic way this concept uh, uh, translational legal approach in my master thesis so it's uh, as i said it's quite difficult paper for me and i uh, working uh, on it and this difficulty uh, is related to a number of uh, issues uh, first of all initially it is based rather on intu intuition and my experience from uh, legal studies uh, not uh, not directly on specific uh, theoretical approaches and uh, and concepts uh, then i uh, worked more on specific theoretical inspira inspirations but there are rather uh, dispersed and there are many of these uh, inspirations uh, because uh, uh, as i said uh, mm, there wasn't clear uh, there wasn't uh, clear mm, a uh, clear proposal of such uh, such approach before so it's it's rather uh, created as new and original and not uh, directly uh, it's not a di direct continuation of uh, any other previous uh, approach uh, then uh, this approach is rather different from mainstream ideas uh, especially of sociology of no, uh, of sociology of law ecological economics and uh, legal approaches and why it's difficult to uh, to present uh, this approach to uh, to many people mm, because for example when we are talking about uh, sociology of law the sociology of law is uh, mm, the main uh, one of the main idea in sociology of law is uh, researching the real influence of law uh, into uh, social reality so uh, to simplify the law is treated as something abstract detached from uh, uh, from uh, social uh, reality there are uh, critics that lawyers are not interested uh, enough in social reality and the contribution of sociology is to uh, provide uh, legal studies the, this uh, the social context and to research how law uh, actually uh, functions in in society what real consequences this uh, uh, law uh, has and uh, especially the sociologists are interested in the cases uh, where something is implemented in law but there is no uh, effectiveness in uh, in real life so in general is uh, sociology is rather focused on what sociology can provide legal studies but the my idea is completely reverse so uh, i agree about this contribution and observation of uh, sociology of law and that it's very important to uh, to research real consequences of law in uh, social life. Uh, however, uh, my idea is uh, is to explore what law, what this traditional legal approaches can provide uh, social uh, perspectives like sociology or ecological economics and degrowth. So how this uh, traditional uh, legal perspectives and thinking uh, because lawyers actually uh, spent a lot of time in working in uh, in uh, policy making how this legal perspective uh, could uh, could help uh, different social perspectives 
to be uh, better uh, better suited to be implemented in uh, in uh, in law and in uh, real policy. Uh, in general, uh, now this is rather general framework and proposed dire direction of research, and actually it can be fulfilled uh, in different ways because uh, there are rather propositions of uh, certain procedures. But when it when we talk about uh, specific methods, uh, I don't uh, propose any very specific methods. So there could be. Uh, as executive research methods used already established, like uh, qualitative content analysis, uh, discourse analysis, analysis, some uh, linguistic methods or, 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 or legal interpretation methods. So uh, this was this, this were this uh, introductory remarks. And when we uh, come to the uh, to the beginning of uh, article uh, as i said it is based on uh, on rather complex structure of research problem um, because there is quite um, um, could be interpre interpreted uh, as gap because my first, uh, my, my target problem, so the problem I am uh, finally interested in is the marginal role of degrowth in uh, policy uh, uh, agenda uh, in, in general. Uh, so, uh, and especially what we can do to make this degrowth more prominent in, uh, in uh, political discussions, social discussions, etc. And my final answer is this translational legal approach. But to connect this target problem with this, my, uh, as I said, a direct problem and the solution like a TLA, there are indirect problems. And, and this way, how I, uh, uh, how I link this, uh, um, this, this target and, and, and my direct problem. Uh, so when we are talking about marginal role of degrowth, we can think about uh, different uh, causes why the degrowth uh, has marginal role. And uh, I think it's, it's most, uh, most obvious and, and I, I rather uh, think about this like that the, um, it should be reasonably argued that the main problems are political, yeah? so. Uh, the why the degrowth is uh, marginal in the policy agenda the 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 main problem could be uh, that is contrary to uh, to main uh, to main and dominating economic interests uh, political interests is contrary to uh, to dominating growth paradigm so uh, so there are uh, that the power and interest relations i think the main problems, uh, and I admin, admit uh, it in the article, but uh, I would like to, um, to focus on other problems, which uh, may be um, easier, to, uh, easier to contribute uh, by me, but there can also uh, um, has, have significant for this uh, power relations problem, so this these other problems could be insufficient operationalization of certain degrowth uh, postulates, uh, as well as gaps in knowledge on governance and, and transition to our uh, degrowth. So uh, I think that if the many degrowth postulates are not uh, enough prepared to be implemented in law, uh, even in, in, in on the textual and theoretical level, so we we can't uh, um, answer uh, questions, possible questions of policymakers. What you propose? How would you, how to, you would like uh, in specific way to implement this degrowth? So if we don't have answer to these problems, it's uh, obvious uh, barriers to. Uh, actually to introduce them uh, into the uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, 
Mm, yeah, and, and and actually start this this political struggle uh, uh, when it comes to degrowth, and uh, addressing these indirect problems. Uh, I and these indirect problems are already formulated in in this way in literature. But to address these indirect problems, I I found and and defined the other problem which in turn contributing uh, to this indirect problem. So uh, there are theoretical and linguistic uh, difficulties in translating degrowth postulates into uh, legal provisions, yeah? So uh, the specific problem is that we have uh, difficulties in, uh, in the case of many degrowth postulates, how we can translate these postulates into specific legal uh, regulations. And by and we and we when we solve this problem, so when we are able to translate some postulates into legal regulations, uh, it quite automatically translates into addressing also this indirect problems and, and target problem. Uh, so the general research question is uh, what approach can support uh, solving and overcoming this theoretical and linguistic difficulties in translating the growth postulates into law? And the answer is this approach I would like to, uh, to propose. And actually why law? Uh, why I am focused on, uh, on law when I would like to address this these problems of operationalization and and the uh, governance of transition into degrowth. So there are uh, uh, so many uh, many observations in uh, in literature why the law uh, is this object uh, that is quite critical for uh, policy implementation operationalization of. Uh, of approaches uh, which uh, we intend to be policy implement uh, implemented, uh, etc. So, uh, first of all, the law is a major means of exercising power and its structural political power. Uh, then we can uh, cite opinion of uh, World Bank that uh, it plays critical role in governance in, uh, in structure behaviors or organizations, individuals, etc. Law can be also treated as reference of preference. So it, it, uh, it reflects the, the preferences of, of current uh, policy, but in, uh, in established textual level, and it creates the model for the world. Yeah, so the uh, Despite the, it's obvious that law not directly reflects the, the social reality, but in to some extent it could reflect, but uh, it creates the, the model uh, how this reality should uh, look like uh, in the intention of, of creators of this law. Uh, actually, uh, law. Uh, when we analyze the historical uh, development of concepts of, of law and policy, and it could be treated even more or less as synonym uh, for uh, synonym for uh, policy. Uh, the role of law increased in re recent decades because we have the juridification uh, juridification uh phenomena that more and more uh, aspects and areas of social reality uh, is uh, regulated mm, and is could be also uh, connected to this uh, rationality in policy making as well as for example the rule of law mm, idea and when law is uh, expressed in legal language, because not all law is uh, expressed in legal language, because there could be, I don't know, for, for example, images in legal acts or mathematical formulas. And uh, when is this legal language aims to be precise, clear, in ambiguous? Uh, it's not 
often is like this and uh, often it's uh, is for the purpose not intended to be too much precise uh, but uh, there is this uh, aims in general to be like uh, that it plays coordinative communicative functions it uh, is central for sustainability transitions as it was uh, argued but there are, of course, these uh, difficulties that there are differences between academic and legal discourse. Uh, when it comes to goals, the, the goals of academics uh, could be very different than uh, uh, goals of uh, lawmakers. There are different uh, concepts, language, but especially that there are uh, theoretic, different theoretical assumptions. Yeah? The most obvious is that the law is normative. Yes, yeah? so it uh, uh, it says about how the reality should look like, but as we know, uh, it's very controversial in academic sphere. Yes, yeah? so uh, very often uh, researchers don't like uh, to um, to state such normative claims or or predictive claims or or uh, or take responsibility uh, how the research uh, is accurate yeah so because researchers are rather careful and they know this uh, this difficulties and unpredictability of social reality uh, etc but law uh, in some uh, sense force us to make this normative uh, normative claim so it's uh, very difficult theoretical uh, uh, theoretical difference but must be addressed if we want to in some way uh, inform uh, law by uh, academic research so to sum up uh, i treat law not at one of many policy instruments because there are sometimes sometimes catalogs like economic instruments financial instruments etc uh, here, the law is rather the basic and fundamental language and form of expressing state uh, policy. So, uh, irrelevant, we are talking about economic instruments, financial, informational, or educational. All these instruments in uh, probably most modern states are based of uh, law. Even in general, they are uh, based of law. So it's why it's this uh, better say that is basic language of expressing uh, state exercising of power and policy, not one of uh, many uh, instruments. Uh, yeah, and to uh, go to this uh, translational legal approach, um, which I uh, Mm, presented the, 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 the mm, motivation for this uh, approach. Uh, in general, I, uh, for my uh, analytical purposes, I, I differentiate uh, models to uh, legal models, which are only normative, and narrative models, that models which are not expressed in legal language, but in other languages like academic language, uh, I don't know, literature language. So this nar rather narrative form, and this uh, narrative models could be descriptive and could be normative. Yeah, that uh, many degrowth uh, papers are rather uh, normative; they propose something. Uh, but there are also a lot of uh, research, also degrowth related, which are descriptive. Say, uh, uh, focused rather on how uh, it uh, the reality looks like. And the general framework for uh, TLA is this, that this narrative, uh, normative or descriptive models can be translated into legal models, into legal provisions on the one hand, and also overcoming these theoretical difficulties. And in turn, this from legal uh, models, we can reconstruct this narrative models. So, uh, what models uh, stay behind existing legal regulations. And we can uh, ask some questions when it comes to this, uh, our intention to translate uh, our, basing on this exam degrowth models into legal regulations. We can ask what uh, original uh, narrative models can be reconstructed from 
from existing law. So how this growth economics was uh, so, so easily or not translated into legal regulations. Uh, how these uh, models, which was recons were reconstructed uh, by us, was prepared into this uh, legal regulations. So why the uh, growth economics and neoclassical economics is uh, so, so easy trans translatable into legal regulations, but in the other academic uh, approaches we have, uh, we have uh, more difficulties in translate them into, into law. Uh, how these alternative models like degrowth, which are uh, mostly not implemented, could be prepared uh, to translation. So how we can overcome this theoretical and uh, linguistic uh, problems. Uh, through what uh, legislative methods uh, step back this original models, growth-based models was implemented into law. So uh, what uh, uh, legal resources were used to implement these models into law. And finally, uh, what resources or resources of legal system of legislative methods we can use to translate these uh, models alternative models, so degrowth in this uh, case, uh, we can use to, to translate these models. Uh, so I will skip some slides. Uh, here uh, are general procedures that we can uh, go through this uh, full procedure, but we can only ask uh, about, uh, about the already implemented model, so how they were uh, prepared, etc. But we can also uh, uh, focus on linear translation. So if we know exactly what are the translation methods, we can directly take the alternative approach and translate them. Uh, so it's uh, it's often done in this way uh, in the policy making when we talking about the the approaches which are already dominating in in law, so and is easily uh, trans, uh, translatable. Uh, maybe I will skip this because here is example. Uh, here are differences between this my TLA uh, approach and other approaches. Uh, so the difference is uh, main difference is like I said that the other approaches are rather focused how law legal methodology could be enriched by sociology, economics, et cetera, uh, transitional studies, how can be enriched and, and how we can uh, uh, and, um, research real, real consequences of law in social uh, reality. But TLA is rather how we can use this traditional, often uh, argued as abstract methods to, to help this academic social approaches to be better suit, suited to, to translating into translating to a legal system. Uh, and, and why the TLA is rather focused on, on, on this textual level and not on a social uh, uh, influence because it's rather the, it's rather a technical a technical tool than the, the holistic analytical uh, tool. And uh, um, for example, we can uh, think about original models and alternative models on examples. Here is exam, for example, uh, uh, from Polish law that the, uh, in entrepreneur's law, the economic activity is uh, defined as gainful activity. Uh, there are gainful purposes. So by law, the, the, by definition, economic activity is uh, uh, directed at gain, but uh, at the same time, we, we have a lot of uh, examples how the uh, ideas which are quite consistent with degrowth uh, are already uh, implemented in systemic way. So we don't have to focus on, uh, on small uh, degrowth initiatives like uh, eco villages, etc. But we can also find uh, systemic solution is in, in existing law 
that uh, we can uh, treat like uh, like degrowth systemic implementations and uh, the exam is is uh, social uh, public benefit activity in in polish law so it's uh, activity uh, mainly connected to non-governmental organizations for example in social assistance health protection etc uh, but what is interesting the polish law uh, also um, also uh, provides that this public benefit activity could be conducted even by uh, very big companies so like joint stock company or limited liability company uh, and uh, so the companies which are uh, mainly directed into growth based policy but also could be uh, could be used in this uh, social uh, public benefit activity so activity which have uh, specifically definite social uh, social goal but in this case uh, all income uh, from this uh, from this joint stock company which would like to conduct this public benefit activity should be reinvest into into company so uh, any benefit uh, cannot be uh, cannot be um, Mm, withdrawn uh, to stakeholders or employers uh, in the form of uh, dividend or or any uh, bonuses, but uh, all this money should be uh, reinvest and spent again into this uh, into this uh, public benefit uh, goal. And I think that, that the idea of TLA is focused, uh, also focused on this already implemented systemic uh, degrowth solutions and, and think how this, this, uh, this solutions could be developed and, and, and spread uh, also in the sense of law to uh, how we can uh, develop these regulations to be better suited to uh, compete in uh, really compete with this uh, very very developed uh, regulations of of growth uh, growth uh, oriented uh, economy so thank you for my, uh, for your attention and i give the floor uh, to iana Well, thank you, Angie, for your presentation. Um, I'm sorry for the lighting because I'm in the north of Sweden and there is no sunlight <laughs> at this time of the year. So um, actually, I wanted to thank you for allowing me to be a part of your PhD journey. I think it's really wonderful. And um, I have some notes. That I prepared firstly um, based on what you sent to me, uh, your paper draft, but also I uh, have some notes here after your presentation as well. And I'll send you all the files and my notes and comments afterwards. Uh, yeah, but you don't have to take them all on board, but you can if you want to. Uh, so, firstly, I want to re highlight the good, uh, and there's so much good in your. PhD journey itself, in your paper and your presentation. And I think um, I've been part of degrowth field since 2016. And uh, I feel that your research is extremely important. And oftentimes, degrowth scholarship is very much detached from policymaking. It's very kind of wishful thinking. And there's a lot of, um, I think, misunderstanding as to how law works and how policymaking works. And uh, one of the biggest issues with degrowth is that it's extremely hard to define. There's no one definition of degrowth. So I can really empathize with you and uh, what you're working with. I think it's very hard to handle degrowth. And now there are more definitions being proposed. So it's extremely hard to work with. So I feel a lot of empathy <laughs> towards you. So uh, now that we really need to see how degrowth and its ideas can be um, operationalized uh, with regards to law and policy making because there's so much in terms of 
kind of painting this picture of a beautiful society that we want, this ecological society, but at the same time, um, sooner or later, we really need to think about um, whether that kind of society can exist and how they can be brought about by uh, policy making and law. So um, my experience that um, I kind of based my um, reading of your work on is by um, uh, publications in journals like Ecological Economics, Futures, Screen of Production, Environmental Values. And so I feel like it will also depend uh, on the journals that you target. And uh, my suggestions in terms of improvement um, are mostly ideas that um, that are based on my uh, opinion that you have extremely, extremely good ideas. You have this extremely great proposal and you have to get that into international journals because it, it, we can discuss these kind of things a lot, but at the same time, you should really target international journals to create a broader discussion as to your own approach and how to implement degrowth in terms of law and policy making. So, uh, and this, in my view, this is how you can really get uh, this kind of research into um, international journals, but it will also depend on the journals that you target. And because then you will do a really great service to society in general, to sustainability and to the growth research community, if you really kind of follow these steps and bring the growth to a broader audience. So this can be discussed at a much larger scale than what we are having at the moment. So um, I think that my first comment is that you really need to remember that your research is useful and will be extremely useful for multidisciplinary audience. And just the first things that came to mind when I was reading your works, and I'm quite familiar I think, with your work right now, and it is the fact that you will kind of speak to economists and degree scholars and philosophers and business scholars, um, because a lot of uh, these journals, they have this international audience and also you speak to policymakers and practitioners. So it is extremely essential to make your arguments very clear and very understandable to as many people as possible. And I think that for this reason, there needs to be so much clarity and you can make a very elegant argument still and be very scientific. Because when I was reading your work, I feel that there's so much that could be um, clarified. Even the title itself, for example, I would really make it as simple as possible. And I would, maybe it's this Nordic kind of vibe that, that we, we really try to simplify everything here. But um, I would say that maybe uh, even something like degrowth and law, translating degrowth research into legal drafts, that could be a title uh, that, that could work. And also, um, I, but I will send this to you. I feel that maybe it's kind of, I'm not sure if I should really be mentioning this uh, more minor stuff. Like uh, when you make an argument, um, I, I would ask myself, where does this, thought belong and also be extremely concrete in your argument um, and also keep when you write keep your sections very short uh, and for example in the introduction you had a law and degrowth and it's kind of part of introduction you can make an introduction and then you can uh, really have another section on law and degrowth and so I would say just streamline your arguments they're so excellent just streamline them and so my but my main comment really is that I feel that you're trying to do too much in one paper. And uh, I I feel that there's so much information that it could be enough for a book. But then remember, the paper is going to be very short. It's going to be eight, uh, nine, probably a thousand words. And so um, I feel that the amount of things that you want to say there uh, in this paper that I read and what you presented, it's too much for one paper, honestly. So I think I would really have a publication plan. Uh, and that would give you this sense, I think, of relaxation. That, okay, I have enough to say in the next, I don't know, five, 10 years. And so just work with these concepts that you have now and think about where you want to publish and which journals you want to target and ask yourself, okay, which, what am I writing for? You know, which journals am I writing for? And um, so when I read your work and now when I listen to your presentation, I feel that, one strategy could be that you can have one paper um, that is about why degrowth needs translation into legal drafts. Uh, generally, I think you you made a really great argument. 
And uh, so you can really expand on that and include systematic literature review because in, in the file that you sent, you have a really great systematic literature review, which is kind of more towards the end or, or middle of the paper. And I felt, it, it, I know how much work goes into a systematic literature review. It's, it's a huge amount of work. And, and to have it somewhere kind of in the middle or at the end of the paper, I think, why? You know, make a separate paper, just find why do you have this translation to um, legal drafts and uh, include systematic literature review and how exactly you um, um, you analyze all that existing literature that is out there. And then another paper could be focused on your framework that you introduce. I think it's really great. And um, in the same paper, you can have an illustrative example. Uh, and then um, another paper uh, could be on a synthesis of your framework with existing approaches. And uh, what are the benefits of your framework? What are the benefits of those existing approaches? And then you could really um, either synthesize or just justify why your framework is, is better, or what, what can be learned from uh, your framework, what can be learned from other approaches. And uh, this paper where you can provide an illustrative example, you could really expand on, um, for example, on your framework and business, because I know that you're interested in uh, legal business stuff. And uh, you can really show to the reader how exactly um, that can be translated. You can take some elements of the growth business framework or the whole degrowth business framework, and you can propose even a whole kind of legal draft as to how to, you know, how to translate this very much detached academic uh, a degree of business framework, which I came up with, and I, I know how this actually is, and uh, uh, because in my uh, book that is coming out soon, we propose some policies, but at the same time, I can see really, especially after listening to the downside of just randomly proposing policies, because there's no concreteness in terms of how exactly that can be translated into legal drafts. You can take an example of Poland or the, the EU law, and so I feel that there are really three papers on that, <laughs> into, to my mind. And uh, so, because it will be extremely hard, I think, to fit everything in one paper. And But why would you even do that? You know, you can have three publications out of these. And also, generally, I, I ask myself, so what went into my thoughts uh, process? And uh, and to be honest, it's really based on what what. Uh, feedback you are very likely to get from your reviewers when you submit that to some journal, like if you submit to future social production. And um, so, also after listening to your presentation, that they, um, I just made some notes. You shared that you had uh, this experience and intuition, um, and, and this part of that kind of went into this construction of your research question and your framework. And I think, uh, why not bring that in, actually? I feel like there is a lot more acceptance now in the scientific community as to what goes into the kind of the um, thought process behind your research. So your experiences, I think that you could really include that. If you, for example, if you have one paper on why do you go this translation into legal draft and systematic literature review, I think yeah, that could be part of your uh, introduction because it's very valuable. I would really include that. Uh, your experiences and uh, intuition as to what is needed. And also, uh, you had some thoughts on um, on the background for your research, and you talked about, for example, the sociology of law, ecological economics, and legal approach. And I think all that, can, you can really include that in, in, uh, in one of the sections and walk the reader through what kind of, uh, what's um, philosophical and scientific and disciplinary um, thinking went into, um, like what led you to ask yourself that research question? And so I guess um, my final comment is um, that you you mentioned, and, and I agree completely, that it's a very complex field, but why not simplify it? And I think that uh, this is something that really helps because our audience is very multidisciplinary. And I think that there is a lot of craving for simplification of, of DGOG. It's not just because uh, DGOG is not just part of the general discourse, but also uh, there is such tendency to mystify it. And remember that still, not everyone is familiar with DGO. Uh, for example, when I talk to many spouses and businesses, uh, it's not that they hate it, <laughs> the concept, they just are not familiar with it. And so we need to really make it uh, somehow more accessible. And uh, yeah, and this is why the simplification um, arguments that really I always thought that I always had on my mind. Well, these are all the thoughts that I have, and I'll send them to you afterwards. And I hope that at least maybe some of it <laughs> would be helpful to you. So, but again, thank you so much for involving me in this process.
Emilia, you are muted. Um, sorry, thank you, Angie, thank do you, you very much. want to the comments? Uh, only say uh, thank you, thank you very, very, very uh, helpful comments, and and uh, for sure uh, I will use them uh, during my uh, uh, later uh, later work because yeah, th 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 these are the problems which uh, I struggle uh, a lot with because on the one hand I. I have to organize these ideas into uh, my mind uh, itself. So it, it's uh, even for me, it's not very easy to uh, to um, co construct th this approach, but to also provide specific background to this approach to to justify that it's not not detached from existing literature, but there are inspiration to make them more, more backgrounded. But at the other hand, uh, to present them in in clear way and in especially con convincing way, yeah, to, to interest someone and yeah, and, and I work. Uh, in general, I've on these problems through years because it, 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 it's. I think it's very common problem that you want to to say a lot and you have a lot of ideas, but you have to reduce something and and not treat this as uh, losses that you uh, these reductions, but actually as as uh, benefits to your work because the, then this work is more convincing, clearer. And and it's not only uh, one paper in, in <laughs> during the life you you can uh, write. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. And I work on this intensively. But honestly, I really have a lot of empathy for you, for your journey, and where you are in your process of becoming a scholar. And you are a scholar already. But uh, when I think about it, I really recognize myself also in, in, in that as well, but it's not that you have to, you don't really have to discount any ideas or lose them or, or eliminate them. It's just that my message, I guess, is to simplify and, and have several papers <laughs> out of this. You know, honestly, you can have several papers and this, I think that's only to your own benefit and also for the benefit of the scientific community, because it will be easier for them to read and also from um, you know, one of the most uh, difficult things, I guess, is to put your work out there to the international audience. Like if you want to publish in, in futures, uh, where you, you, I think you have research going to futures, for example. Um, uh, and you just don't know who your reviewers are going to be. And uh, very likely, they're going to be, uh, let's say you get a philosopher and an economist. And, and for them, uh, you know, if it's too difficult to understand, uh, and if that, if there's so much, this is what they will say to you. They will, they will say that there are several papers in there. And so uh, remember that, you know, your reviewers are probably not going to be legal scholars, or maybe one of them will be, but the other two will be coming from some other discipline. And so, yeah. And I think um, you can also say to them, I can now slow down because I have so much information. Now I just need to um, make that uh, very clear and put that information in, in very elegant papers. And ask myself, is that comprehensible to my readers? And uh, yeah, uh, so it, it's I really like the content so much, and I, so I feel that um, yeah, when if you decide to, to simplify and break it down into several papers, I think your journey will be much easier. You know that you don't now have to think, oh, what was my next paper going to be? But you you can say to yourself, I already have enough information. Maybe there are some, so you can actually say more if you have three papers out of this. You can say more about every single topic that that you want to include, and so that will give you a, a lot of space as well. Yeah. Um. Thank you a lot. Are there any questions or remarks? Am I allowed to speak from far away? <laughs> uh, my name is Colin, Colin Curtin, and uh, I'm from Australia. I've supported Andre with some software for his work. Um, I can yeah, say that. Thank you. Way... <laughs> <laughs> but all right. um, I can say I fully support what Ayana is saying about splitting your paper. I have not read your paper. Your research field is alien to my research field, as I'm in the medical pharmacy field. But it's very key and very important to split your paper into key ideas and key concepts. Um, 
if you have a lot of good information that you need to get to an audience, it's not just the reviewers and the editor that you have to convince. You have to think of that other person at the other end who's going to read your article and get excited by it. They're only going to get excited by a short, hard-hitting article that hits them with the big concept first and makes a, a great discussion and a, and a great conclusion around the main idea. That makes your work more valuable. If it's shorter and less concepts in one paper, then if they're more interested, they'll go to read your second paper on your other concept and so on. And that is how I would definitely support that approach. My students have the same problem with our research studies. Um, often if it's a survey, they may put too much in the one paper and the paper becomes confusing in the results section and boring to read in the discussion section because it's too long and too convoluted. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you a lot. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, because we are talking about a specific article, I was wondering whether you could maybe, Andre, talk uh, more about your PhD thesis and how this particular article fits in your bigger research agenda. Yeah, uh, actually, this 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 uh, first paper, or 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 rather uh, papers, because I, I think it's a good idea to uh, to split this uh, the content into into more papers to to more to make uh, them more uh, more accessible. Uh, they are, I think, conceptual and methodological part. Yeah, so they uh, present and justify the, the idea what I am uh, focused on law, uh, why this idea of translating uh, degrowth ideas into law, uh, um, why, why this idea is worth to, to explore. Uh, yeah, and I think it's most difficult uh, for me, but in the next, uh, Next papers, I would like to uh, only to general uh, outline this approach, but in one section to uh, make reference to these previous uh, papers and apply uh, this this approach to specific uh, specific kind of regulations and I think on business regulations. Yeah, so. Uh, so especially I think that this um, general regulations related to social economy, they are quite uh, developed and there are uh, examples uh, in Polish uh, legislation, but also EU legislation. So apply uh, to uh, apply to them. And, and then uh, this TLA will be used in specific methodology. I, I think that this uh qualitative approach in qualitative content analysis uh, uh will be quite uh, quite uh, su suited and and and, and uh, good uh, well correspond corresponds to this um to this topic thank you um, is, are there any volunteers to speak? May I uh, comment as well? Uh, in, in fact, I, I would like to share thanks to Jana for uh, her uh, division idea. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I was trying to uh, unsuccessfully convince Andre to, to simplify uh, this paper, uh, but keeping in mind that it is the first paper and the second and the third would be the application. Um, but perhaps Andre has too much to say for such uh, an um, effort and the uh, better idea would be to split what is already in into parts, uh, somehow leaving apart uh, the application part. It seemed to be perhaps the better strategy for, for, for 
completing the 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 PhD. It is to be well discussed, but but I I think it's a it's a very good idea. It's it's appealing to me, in fact. Um, but the the main issue uh, remains, uh, and Jana also you you mentioned that is the simplification of the complexity which is in, and. Uh, uh, to me, the, the, the main uh, uh, interesting idea in this work is, is the translation, the, the very notion of translation, which is very much, uh, I would call it unique for the uh, this area of the study, with, which is in between the ecological economics, sociology, and, and legal studies. Um, and, and in fact, uh, the Institute for Philosophy and Sociology is the perfect location for such a study because it, it is, I would call it, in between the ideas of uh, Wittgenstein's uh, idea of uh, language games and, and quite a, a legal uh, understanding of, of uh, assertions which are in law, in, in, in fact. And, Etc. And at the same time, uh, more sociological uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, dealing with the narratives as well. So, so it, it is indeed to me very original, although not yet developed to to be a mature proposal for 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 the academic audience, um, I, I, I think. Uh, I have one more uh, issue which I realized now, and I, in some, I think more than a hundred comments, which I already uh, commented uh, previous versions of, of this paper was not mentioned yet. And, and that is the distinction between uh, the, which is in John Searle's uh, idea of language, the distinction between descriptive language and performative language. So one, one issue is that uh, you can describe uh, the, you call it existing ideas or existing uh, settings uh, uh, and the proposed degrowth uh, setting of uh, legal framework. Uh, and you can present it. And, and in fact, translation, it seems to me not so much difficult. Uh, the problem is that, that you somehow, I'm afraid you assume that it has a performative function. So if it is translated, then it is in fact acting. While on the way, there is the whole uh, uh, procedure of putting the law into practice. So finally, it has to be voted. Uh, and uh, that's, Jan also mentioned that, that this idea can be, uh, the idea of degrowth can be very far from understanding and uh, by various actors, and it can be even uh, opposed openly. And, and, and the issue is here, whether you treat degrowth as an example of your framework uh, to, be, to be used for, for uh, um, exercise, and it could be used for any other concept beside the growth, whatever we can call it, uh, or it is particularly fo focused on the growth. That, that is not really clarified in, in, in your, in your uh, work, I'm afraid. Okay, so I have several more issues, but that that is to be to be perhaps later uh, exchange with with Andre. Thank you. Can I just react to what Nicolas said? And I think uh, I really love this comment on um, translation, actually, because I just that uh, just came to my mind as a reaction to uh, what his supervisor are saying. And I think um, translation generally, if I, I'm not thinking of uh, dozens probably of uh, experts. <laughs> or scholars of degrowth and practitioners of degrowth that I know of, they probably most likely have not uh, understood the concept of translation for them, it will be difficult to, to understand it. So I think perhaps uh, you can include a section in, in one of these papers, uh, especially kind of the earlier paper um, on philosophy behind your work, because you have a lot of, um, in terms of um, 
um, scientific uh, disciplinary groundings and, uh, for example, ecological, economic, sociology, legal studies. But at the same time, you can have a section on uh, philosophical groundings. And I think it's a very good idea. And uh, you can include in there the notion of uh, translation, maybe philosophy of language. And you mentioned um, uh, Wittgenstein, for example. So philosophical groundings, uh, that would be very much enlightening, I think, to your um, reader. And so I think uh, then uh, the notion of translation and its usefulness would be picked up by economists, by policymakers. So I think that, that could work as well. Uh, so you'd have um, the disciplinary groundings and philosophical groundings quite explicitly because they're there, of course. But uh, but you know, just to explicate them, you know, just be extremely honest about that and say, well, these are what they are. And then also another idea that I had uh, for one of your later works, probably you could have uh, because uh, you're trying to really make Diego um, more. Kind of easier to handle for policymakers that say you could have uh, some like expert interviews and focus groups much later in your study and just uh, have some kind of focus groups with policymakers and see how they react to to the um, legal jobs you have. So, but I think um, philosophical groundings that could be an explicit notion of translation itself that could be an excellent, excellent idea. Thank you a lot. Mm. Okay, maybe I will ask the question as I have this tendency to ask for some historical contextualizations. And uh, so in the case of Poland, you have this society that uh, that has entered into this growth oriented sort of uh, normative um, type of uh, legislation just lately. And uh, now what you are proposing is uh, like abandoning this sort of concept. Uh, so I'm I would like to ask about like this Eastern European specificity, um, um, and does it play out in in your work? Do you see the differences um, between the Eastern European and uh, Western European context? And uh, if so, how how would you explain those differences? Are they specific to this uh, center periphery sort of relation, or are they specific to this like? of the communication process, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, uh, mm, actually, I uh, so it's also quite difficult to, to, to often to explain. I, I'm not, I'm focused rather on textual level, yeah? yeah? So on translation from, from for example, uh, research papers to drafts of, uh, to, to legal drafts. And, uh, and and uh, it's rather at uh, meta level and, and textual level. And so my, in general, my work ends when we create this legal draft, yeah? But uh, how it uh, will be used later, for example, uh, by social movements or by politicians and in what country, so uh, it's, not, uh, it's not subject of, of at least uh, on this paper uh, uh, and, and on this work. Uh, however, uh, however, uh, and of course, I, I think that the, the, the differences, social differences between between countries and contexts are, are very important. Uh, but what this framework could provide, I think is that, that we can, uh, by analyzing different legal systems, uh, we can identify uh, the degrowth elements or, or, or mm, we can suppose that this specific ideas impl implemented already in law in different legal systems are in line with uh, degrowth, yeah? And uh, even, in, uh, even in Poland, I think that the I think that the situation is is not clear because uh, okay we are in post communist country and, and focus on on uh, development but I think that the the, the uh, idea of growth itself is is not very close to to average people yeah because I think that the GDP growth despite the politician uh, use this indicator 
is quite far from uh, from uh, a daily experience of uh, of uh, people. They are uh, rather focused on their work, uh, salaries, the level of life, and. Uh, but this growth in the mathematical sense of the whole economy is rather something that is quite abstract for uh, for people. So I think is is uh, is chance that uh, that if we can address the the um, the experience level of life of average people without this uh, growth, uh, mathematical growth of the whole economy, the people could actually accept the degrowth because they are rather focused on their uh, daily experience, not on the uh, quite abstract uh, economic uh, indicator. So I, I, I would say that, but, uh, but of course, uh, very often economic indicators translate uh, into uh, into the daily life uh, daily life of uh, um, of people yeah but but, but for example in the uh, case of Poland we can have some uh, examples uh, which we can discuss as in line with degro for example the uh, mm, oh of course, we not discussed the, the, the uh, how it was uh, how it was uh, realized in in in, uh, in details. But for example, uh, ban for trade in uh, Sundays. Yeah, that some days should be uh, free from uh, trade. Yeah, I think it's in certain sense is degrowth idea. Yeah, that that not all. Uh, a week uh, have to be have to be dedicated to work, yeah. Or for example, five hundred plus that this benefit for uh, for child uh, with uh, which all people with child childs uh, receive benefits. Actually, only for uh, having child, yeah. So not for work. And in on the one hand, it's contrary to this neoliberal thinking that the money should be for work that and free money is rather interpreted that it's uh, is uh, something like 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 pathology but it was uh, implemented in poland so so i think that this despite we, we uh, poland as post communist country joined to this a uh, growth uh, oriented community but during communist uh, communist time Economy also was oriented at growth, but in in communist uh, form. But the, the the goal was quite the same. Uh, but this openness uh, in Poland for for I don't know benefits and not such such uh, strong uh, strong uh, idea that money should be only for for work, but this. Um, Mm, this expectation that state should uh, state should care on people, I think, is is, is actually chance to for for degrowth ideas to be uh, to be implemented, yeah, because the, the, there is need philosophical uh, philosophical uh, and, and ideolog ideological shift, yeah, that for example, basic la uh, basic material uh, uh, level uh, of life should be interpreted not as something that uh, people should work for, but rather as right, yeah? That is obvious that in modern economy, uh, everyone should have decent uh, level of life. And actually it was implemented in law, but in different uh, ways, like, I don't know, uh, unemployment benefits, but there are still unemployment benefits, yeah. But this five hundred plus that is benefited only for child without uh, other conditions is uh, could be interpreted as quite good example, uh, which is worth to uh, explore. I think. Okay, thank you a lot. We've run out of time, uh, sadly. Thank you a lot for those um, for this very interesting discussion.
um, for those who are celebrating this week, uh, Merry Christmas to you all. And I think that um, we can conclude the session now. So if Andrzej or our guests have uh, anything to say or farewell, please. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, but also I have one final, final comment that I'll send it to you because Emilia actually had a really wonderful point about uh, varieties of capitalism. And I know that it's not the center of your work, but in some contexts, actually, uh, policy making can have much stronger effects and impacts than in some countries than in other countries. And I think even if you don't make it central to your uh, PhD, you can still mention it. And I'll send you your work actually um, in, in an email after this uh, about varieties of capitalism. Because because uh, in some contexts, policy making can have much that. impact. And uh, yeah, I'll send it to you right after this. But Merry Christmas. Thank you. You too, Merry Christmas. And thank yes. you for a uh, uh, supportive comment. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you.